Hello, everybody. It's John Lodra here, one of the founding partners here at New Harbor Financial Group for our weekly market video for our clients and friends. We here are driven by a desire to bring you data, insight about that data, and of course, tying it back to the purpose of what we're here, really to help our clients navigate, hopefully, successful and stress-free and happy lives as might be enabled by their financial situation. Of course, life is much more than about money. And we know that, our clients know that, but it's a it's an important part of the equation. We uh, Here it is Wednesday, November 29th, uh, just about to turn the page on another month. And what a month it's been. Um, we, we've seen a, a, a very rapid rise in, in many areas of the market over the last month. In fact, the S&P 500 uh, bottomed most recently on uh, October 27th. And the S&P 500, uh, for example, has risen over, I think, 11% uh, in that not even quite, well, I guess it's just a little bit over a month. Very sharp move higher. And it's just not the S&P 500, a lot of things. In fact, um, we're very glad that the way we have our clients positioned, by and large, there's been some very nice moves higher in a lot of the things that we hold for clients, even though we still remain uh, very defensively postured without taking, in our assessment, a, a, a large amount of risk. We do still think it's an environment to be cautious and, and patient, but uh, we are very much taking uh, tactical approaches. I'd like to uh, cover a couple of things in this video. First of all, the title uh, gave it away in some, some respects. Um, want to talk about uh, the uh, outlook for short-term interest rates in particular. Uh, has massive ramifications uh, about markets and the system and everyday living, frankly, for that matter, as we, as we know from the last decade. And then I'd also like to uh, cover some salient parts about uh, you know the market and and some of the holdings that that we have. Um, so tr try and keep it to the point here, but hopefully informative and helpful for you folks. So again, the massive rise in in many assets over the last month. It was just it was stocks, it was bonds, it was uh, many forms of commodities. Um, Talk about gold, for example, has had a very, very nice move in gold miners, uh, for example. Um, but let's let's rewind the tapes a bit. Um, one of the key reasons the market has risen so quickly, so so soon. Well, the market was a bit oversold. It was a little exhausted, if you will, from from some pretty heavy selling into late October from the most recent peak in at the end of July of this year. We've had a we had a pretty you know tough uh, August September October in broad markets and they kind of exhausted themselves so there was an oversold condition as we call it but there were a series of uh, events all around the same time at uh, at the end of October one of them was a rather surprisingly somewhat positively um, surprising uh, uh, inflation report that came out where some of the headline inflation numbers came in um, softer than expected. Uh, that was coincided with some um, news and moves from the Treasury Department, basically announcing that some of the debt funding that they were looking to uh, finance to issue in the form of bonds was going to come in a lo little lighter than the market had expected. Uh, and bonds had sold off leading up to that pretty pretty dramatically on, on the, the fears of deficit spending and, and massive amounts of bond issuance. But so a little, lightly, little lighter expectation of bond issuance, but also... A, um, a statement by the Treasury that they're going to prioritize uh, issuing bonds in the form of more in the form of short term Treasury bills than longer term bonds than what the market was expected. So that was cheerleaded. And then, of course, there was a Federal Reserve meeting in, in late October that added some fuel to the fire, let's say. The, the upshot of that is the market rather abruptly, and I say the market, the market participants, um, rather abruptly changed their outlook in terms of what. Uh, Federal Reserve interest rate policy will likely be. In a nutshell, the market has all but concluded almost with certainty that the Fed is done hiking, that their last rate hike on July 26, I think it was, uh, was will be the last one in this cycle. And not only that, but the market is pricing in a, uh, a much higher probability of the Fed starting to start to drop short-term rates as we get into late spring and, and summer and beyond next year. Now, I want to make one very important point. The market has oftentimes been wrong in this regard. In fact, I think there was uh, there was a really interesting chart that was put out. I forget who, who published it, but um, there have been seven distinct uh, missed calls, if you will, by the market, you know, calling for a Fed pivot 
in this 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 uh, rate rise cycle, all of which have tur turned out to be wrong. And the Fed itself has been um, very insistent in communicating that they foresee a higher for longer. They're they're not talking about rate cuts. They have started to talk a bit more about policy rates being maybe in the right area. In other words, we may pause here and maybe pause permanently before someday down the road, but we're not even thinking about it, start to lower rates. But the market, for, for better or for worse, has rather abruptly changed its, its expectations. I'm going to share a chart here to kind of show you what I'm talking about there. This chart is from what's called the CME Fed Watch tool. And a couple of things here. So right now, the policy rate on the short-term Federal Reserve target rate is 5.25 to 5.5 percent. That's essentially where we are right now. OK, and this drives all kinds of things like short term CDs, Treasury bills and whatnot. Doesn't really affect directly longer term rates like mortgage rates. There is a linkage there, but it's not precise. But you can see uh, and then here are the upcoming Federal Reserve Open Market Committee dates at which the Fed makes decision to to raise rates, keep them the same or drop them. So you can see that those those meetings are scheduled out. Uh, one more this year and then throughout next year. So this is basically the probability that the market is assigning at these meetings that the rate will be in, in at, at the current rate. So basically, there's a very, very small chance in December and January the market is, is pricing in a Fed rate rise. And as early as January, the market is now, and this is as of today on the Fed Watch tool, there's a 5% market pricing here, 5% chance that the Fed will drop a quarter basis point to five to five and a quarter uh, at the January meeting. If you look here, basically no change is 90-ish is percent or more for the next meeting. But starting in March, the market's pricing in a, a possibility of 50% chance of ease of, of some degree from current rates. And by next summer, greater than 90%, almost you know, essentially 100% by we get to, to mid-summer that the Fed will have dropped rates. Key question, what does this mean for markets? I'm going to go to another chart here that was actually prepared by Charles Schwab. This actually looks at data going back all the way to 1929. And it basically says when the Fed stops hiking, in, in other words, the last hike in a cycle, and there's some pause before the next move, which would be a drop. But that's that pause or that last hike is denoted by time zero here. OK, and this is prior to the last hike. So let's just focus after the last hike. And and if if the, if the Fed is, in fact, done hiking the cycle, July 26 would be this time zero. So here we are about 120 ish days, I think, out from there. So we're right here. Basically, what this chart shows is that of all the hiking cycles going back to 29, um, the average is this is this um, blue line um, and it shows the percentage change in the S&P this many days out. As you can see, that average is rather uninteresting. And there's a there's a saying analysis of averages leads to average analysis. In other words, you, you lose a lot of important context and data when you simply take averages. And in fact, if uh, if you look at what the, the red and green areas represent, they represent the worst and the best range uh, over all those hiking cycles. So you can see uh, in one of those hiking cycles, you know, 60 ish, 60 plus days out, there was actually almost a 40 percent decline in, in the mar in the market S&P. I'm going to fast forward to the next page, which basically puts this on the table. These are all the, the hiking cycles. One of the things we're seeing a lot of things in, 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 in on bubble vision and financial media basically saying, oh, the Fed's done hiking and on average or, or typically if you look at the, the most recent cycles, there, it's a very positive event for the market. And invariably, those talking heads are, are looking at some data points here, like, for example, in 18, that it, that it was true that the, the Fed stopped hiking and there was some very strong performance six and 12 months later and, you know, 2006, the same thing. But then you look at areas like 2000 or you look at 81 or you look at 74 or, of course, if you look back to 1929, the key takeaway here is not quite as simple as saying when the Fed pauses, this is what happens. It's really contextual based upon a whole lot of things. And we think one of the most important things is valuations. If you look at areas where the stock markets were very highly valued, more often than not, you saw big declines. So, for example, 1929, right before the Great Depression in the 70s, early 70s, when you saw, you know, really high valuations combined with inflation in the late 60s, even. And of course, 2000, the tech bubble. Even this 2006 is an anomaly because, of course, shortly thereafter, 2008 hit and we saw an over 60 percent peak to trough decline in the S&P from October 07 through March of 09. One final chart I want to pull up before we pause here. 
this is just looking at the most recent snapshot of his chart I pulled together, basically looking at the S&P 500 here, this is the black line, and that's on this uh, left axis. The blue line is the federal funds rates, uh, and that's on the, this right axis. And then I, I plotted a red dot anytime there was a, a Fed increase, rate increase, and a green dot when there was a Fed decrease. I want you to notice here that the last two bubble peaks, most people, the market has certainly cheerleaded this prospect of the Fed starting to cut rates. But I would say be careful what you wish for, because in certain cycles, and we think we're in one of those likely cycles, the Fed cutting rates is not a good thing. It's actually typically a reactive thing to uh, markets and economies in free fall. And in fact, that's what you see in the last two major bubbles here, the tech bubble and the housing bubble. Despite this massive decline in, in rates here, went from you know, almost 7% down to 1% or so. And despite these discrete drops in rates right here, these green dots, you can see the market kept falling. That was an over 50% decline in the uh, S&P. NASDAQ fell over 80%. Again, here, the housing bubble, these rate drops, you know, in other words, hey, the Fed is starting to, to inject liquidity again, lowering interest rates. Sometimes the market doesn't care because it's in free fall. And I, I think it's very likely that the, the market may have it wrong here. Not only the likelihood of, of the Fed raising uh, dropping rates in, in a you know soft landing scenario, if they do actually drop short term rates, that will likely be a representative of, a, of their desperate reaction to a, a, a market financial system and an economy in somewhat of a free fall. So I'll take uh, away from the charts here and come come face you again face to face. Uh, why does this matter? Of course, um, you know, for folks that are invested in in assets, um, you know, stocks or bonds, that can have dramatic implications, uh, as we saw in the last two bubbles. So you know, we we think uh, our defensive posturing is 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 quite um, timely and appropriate for this kind of scenario. Um, but you know, if the again, I think the the market is over over. Um, overestimating or, or over over predicting the likelihood of of the fed dropping rates they they have a pretty high bar they they are deathly afraid of inflation kind of rearing its head again and uh especially i think it's highly unlikely that they drop rates in a soft landing scenario i think and data would would actually i think support this if you go back and study the context uh, a, a, again, a, a scenario of the Fed dropping rates is, is not likely to be a good thing, but a, a panicked move to try to stem the tide of, of markets and free fall in an economy and a, and a significant slowdown. But if they do lower rates, of course, that has implications in a lot of ways, including, for example, savings rates. You know, we, we have finally, over the last year and a half, had a compelling alternative to uh, super highly overvalued stocks. And that has been in the form of short-term treasuries and cash equivalents that are paying very compelling uh, rates of return on annual yields of now over 5% on some of the shorter end of the curve um, and without any market risk. Um, so really, really good, compelling alternative. And we've, as, as viewers know, we've been holding and clients know, we've been holding quite a large balance in short-term treasuries. We have about 40, 45% right now in short-term treasuries. We've been as high as almost 60 at that point. So over the last uh, year and a half. Um, so, um, if if they do start to raise rates, unfortunately, that will take some of that that good. There is an alternative juice out of the equation, and we might see things like CD rates start to come down again, um, T bill rates start to come down again, and we have actually been starting to systematically move our T bill maturities out longer. I think the last piece we did was nearly a year in in, in maturity, so we're trying to extend out in the event that they do start cutting uh, short term rates. That at least we have. Um, mitigated somewhat the reinvestment risk of, of these short-term treasuries maturing and rolling over at, you know, then possibly lower interest rates. So we're, we're taking actions there to, um, to, to handle that. Um, you know, I wanted to quickly talk about long-term rates as well, because there is a, you know, obviously we, we, we've been very much more bullish on short-term treasuries than long-term, but we have had a tactical 10 to 15 percent allocation to longer term treasury bonds, which have actually, you know, if you go back to where they were in 2020, they have gotten pummeled. They have they lost between March or spring of 2020 and uh, the end of October this year. Treasury long term treasury bonds lost more than the stock market lost in the great financial crisis. That is a massive sell off in, in literally the biggest market of the world, the, the U.S. Treasury market and supposedly the, the safest. Um, but we 
felt very strongly and, and uh, still feel uh, that 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 got overdone. In fact, we've seen a, a very sharp rebound in in those treasury bonds over the last month, along with the stock market. And we certainly have, have welcomed that for our clients. We, we did do some very tactical and active hedging uh, during those declines um, that helped out. But we're, we're glad that we, you know, you know, manage that position in, in, a, in a very tactical way. And just recently, a short term trade, we, we actually did sell some call options on this strength in, in, in these treasury bonds, it allowed us to take in uh, uh, option premium that effectively added about, um, well, I don't know, one, one, over 1% 1 effective additional yield by bringing in this option premium. If you had analyzed that, uh, annualized that out, it was almost 20% annualized yield. Now, that's not a proper thing to do because we can't statically say we can keep selling call options to bring that yield but just gives you a, an example of uh, on the strength in treasury bonds we are still taking some tactical moves to bring in some additional income in the form of call option premium and happy to talk to clients about that if if, if they wish uh, to explain further um but you know looking at the longer term picture uh, we, we're not as pound the table bullish on on long-term bonds as some people are we think we're um uh, in a in a new era um that is going to look different than the last 40 years. If you look at long-term treasury bonds, in fact, I'll bring up that chart here in just a second so we can look at that. I'm going to show you a chart of 10-year treasury bonds. And here we go. So this chart goes back to the 60s, I think. And this is right off the Federal Reserve's uh, website. It shows uh, on the axis here the percentage interest rate on constant maturity 10-year treasury bonds you see in the uh, early 80s those got as high as over 15 percent um and here is what where we are in recent years they they bottomed they actually touched on it on a day in 2020 i think 0.49 percent maybe even lower but really low uh, and that was in the in the height of the sell-off and and flight to safety during covid and then since then those yields have driven risen rather dramatically and that is the reason that the long-term bonds sold off quite dramatically over the last few years now you can see this little squiggle down those rates have dropped you know they got as high as five percent they dropped as low as 4.4 ish percent or so and that little squiggle there was enough to give you know a nice boost to, to the long-term bond prices upward but i want you know for those folks that are uh, you know first of all saying that in a recession or predicting a recession, and that means bond rates are, are going to come down. We don't think it's quite that easy. First of all, we think it's it's a quite likely we may see a stagflationary environment, which is kind of the worst of all. It's it's where you have uh, persistently high prices and, and inflation, and at the same time a, a stagnation, a slowing of growth, uh, you know, things like that. And that was what the 70s were were really like. And if you look at the 70s actually treasury rates didn't decline they actually kind of went sideways chopped around and actually went up a bit so this notion that definitely going to have a recession and that would be good for bonds i think is a little too easy and it's also a little too easy because i think we need to recalibrate our reference point this last decade in, in the wake of the financial crisis here interest rates on all things short-term rates but also long-term bonds through qe we're driven down to artificially low levels. And now if you look here where we are right now, we're at, you know, four and a half to five or so, let's call it. And if you look at all prior recessions, and in fact, the gray areas are the recessions, with the exception of the housing crisis and the great financial crisis, those treasury yields bottomed at or higher, significantly higher, in fact, than where we are right now. So we're, we're bullish on bonds and we think there will probably be a short window of a flight to safety, but we are not of the mind that these are pound the table, long-term, once in a lifetime buying opportunities, because we do believe this interest rate picture has has changed markedly and, and we, we won't see such a quick decline in rates as we maybe have seen before, because the experiment has left the station, in our opinion, in terms of the quantitative easing. It's, there, there are consequences now that we think were present when the Fed exercised this in, in, in the um, decade after the great financial crisis. We do have for our clients about a 10 to 15-ish percent allocation to long-term treasury bonds, but um, we're still very constructive on them in the short term. But that that picture I just showed explains why we're not, you know, of the mind that uh, you should be loading up um, a portfolio, uh, you know, uh, you know, loading up on a, like a 60-40 portfolio, in a, a, um, you know, of stocks and, and bonds, because both stocks and bonds we think are still priced in in tricky territory and in large part uh, a, a large amount of uh, safe liquid assets like short-term treasuries should still be 
um, should it be st still be part of the, the equation. Um, uh, you know, segue from that, I wanted to kind of share an interesting chart. Um, and, um, you know, basically when you look at that there has been an alternative in cash over the last uh, couple of years, the Fed started the, their hiking cycle in March of, of 2022. So I'm gonna share a chart just showing, um, you know, what that alternative has looked like. And this chart basically shows um, a comparison of, of a, an ETF that holds one to three months treasury bills. You can call that cash. These are cash equivalents, short-term treasury bills. And you can see a nice steady total return. Over that time time frame, the total return as rates have stair-stepped higher by the Fed's actions, the total return of that period is 5.89%. If you compare that to, to broad market indices, even the S&P 500, which is cap-weighted and, and very heavily influenced by the, the so-called MAG-7 stocks, that's barely, barely outperformed that. And that's only just recently on this recent bounce. And, and there was a, a period here, right here. But interesting that with no market risk, you have you, you essentially got most or in fact outperformed for most of the period, the S&P 500. But if you look even further beneath the, the, the covers of the market, which has been a very narrow market by these large cap tech stocks, if you just take the S&P 500 and equal weight, it give each of the 500 companies equal weight, you're worse off. You're down about 2% since then, and you know, would have been much better in cash. And of course, cash did better than than treasury bonds that that got hammered too. So the classic 60-40 portfolio has been a big disappointment in the rearview mirror, and we think it's going to be a, a challenge going forward. In fact, Vanguard does too. I, I highlighted in a in a timely take video, uh, I believe last week, a uh, report that Vanguard came out, you know, r raising some veiled concerns about the the prudence of a static 60 40 portfolio but again if, if you go back to this chart even and you look at small caps the russell 2000 those have vastly outperformed cash so cash has been a a very effective alternative and still remains to be in our opinion and there'll be a time where, where we think stock prices will come back uh pretty dramatically and, and make a much more compelling risk reward uh, all that being said if we look at our short-term technical indicators um, they are positive, um, you know, which basically means even against the backdrop of crazy overvaluation, there is likely the potential for some further upside in the market here, maybe through year end, maybe into in, into early next year. So we're going to, but the other, on the other hand, um, markets have risen so far so fast, there is a bit of a, what we call overbought situation. So we're going to be very selective and we may very well likely sprinkle in some more uh upside equity exposure, we likely would do so with hedges and, and may likely wait for a bit of a pullback to do that. But we no, make no mistake about it, we we are going to still uh, emphasize defense because we do think the, the largest opportunity is yet to come uh, and be patient. I wanted to quickly talk about gold. Um, gold mining stocks, which we've hold, held for you know, a long time for clients, have been rather frustrating for us and for our clients because they've been rather range bound. In fact, They've also underperformed the price of gold, the, the metal, the bullion itself. Um, but there's been uh, actually some really um, positive improvements. In, in fact, uh, gold mining stocks have, have rallied really dramatically over the last month. In, uh, in fact, yesterday, Wednesday the 28th, there was a very large move in the gold mining stocks and uh, almost, I think, four and a half percent. And it broke out of some key technical uh, resistance levels. I'm not going to get into those charts right now uh, for the sake of time. But the other thing in recent months, last one and three months on a total return basis, um, gold mining stocks, if you use, for example, GDX, a T ETF that holds uh, gold mining stocks, it's outperformed the, the, the price of metal itself, which metal is now um, closed pretty consistently for a, a handful of days here above 2000. And we think uh, we're, we're testing a triple top here on a technical basis that could see gold go to 2500. And we think that will follow through with, with tremendous upside in the miners. Um, but I did want to share a couple of charts putting the gold miners into context because as frustrating as it, they've been, they've actually been pretty pretty decently okay for uh, us and our clients. Um, and in fact, if you look here, this is a um, a chart showing gold miners versus major market indices going back to the S and P 500 all time closing high of of January 3rd of 2022, so almost two years ago. And you look here, gold gold miners are actually positive 1.62 percent on a total return basis. And even the S&P 500 with these you know, heavy weightings to the, the MAG-7 stocks is on a total return basis lagging that. 
And then if you look at some of the, the like the equal weights, S&P and, and the, the small caps, gold miners actually have uh, performed quite nicely. Let's look at gold, you know, sec on a sector basis. And this is year to date 2023 through yesterday, the 28th of, of no uh, November. If you exclude for a moment the, the high flying uh, sectors that are really heavily influenced by these super overvalued uh, mag seven stocks, you know, the technology, the uh, discretion, discretionary consumer and um, and the communications. The gold mining sector has actually outperformed most other sectors. You know, it's up year to date through yesterday, about almost 9%. Uh, industrials, I think, are 8.72. But there are plenty of sectors that are, you know, flat or even down on the year. So so as much frustration as the coal mining stocks have given us and, and you, our clients, um, they actually have hung in there remarkably well. And we think we've seen some recent developments here with gold breaking out, gold and metal breaking out that will likely catapult um, gold miners uh, quite a bit higher. Uh, GDX is around $31 a share right now. We can see that getting up 33, 34, maybe 35 pretty easily. And there'll be some resistance there. So we're not talking about a shoot the moon overnight kind of thing, but um, we're very happy to have that shaping up. I, uh, I want to stop the video here. I, I appreciate you listening here. And uh, as always, we invite questions, comments, suggestions from our clients and viewers. Uh, and these videos certainly aren't going to take the place of the, the very frequent one-to-one -one conversations we have with our clients. Again, thank you for listening. And um, until next week, we uh, all want to say thank you and I wish you a great day. Bye now.